Western Asia, Europe, or North America, you've probably seen them while digging up some dirt, or maybe even after the rain on the sidewalk. Something interesting about the earthworms found in North America is that nearly all of them are invasive species. During the last ice age, just about all of the native species of North American earthworms were wiped out. They were later replaced by settlers who brought their own over from Europe, thinking that they would help the soil. While they can be pretty beneficial when it comes to composting, they actually are a hindrance on northern forests because they consume the topsoil, or duff, that trees need to survive. The only native earthworms you'll find in North America live in the far south where the glaciers of the Ice Age weren't able to completely freeze the land. Among all the earthworms in the world, we have discovered over 6,000 species. Although they typically only grow to be a few inches long, some of the largest ones measure over a foot. Their bodies are made up of over 100 segments called annuli, and each segment has small bristles called setae, which allow them to move about underground. They usually live in dirt and in organic waste produced by trees. Or, you know, leaves. As they move about, they actually eat the soil in which they live. In fact, an earthworm can eat up to a third of its body weight in a day. Of course, weighing in at less than a slice of bread, that doesn't seem like much, but for comparison, that would be like if my cat Chester, who weighs approximately 10 to 12 pounds, ate 4 pounds of food a day. And while I'm sure Chester would be extremely happy with that situation, on average he eats just over 3 ounces of food per day, meaning 4 pounds of food would be over 2,000% of his daily needs. Of course, Chester isn't a worm, and this comparison was just a ploy to inject him into this episode, so moving on. When looking at an earthworm, one may wonder exactly which end is which. An easy indicator is the band, or the clitellum. If we divide the worm into three sections with the clitellum as the middle, it's easy to figure out the rest. The shorter section is the head, and the longer section is the rear end. Although they don't have eyes, they do have light-sensitive tissue on their head. They also have a gizzard which contains stones that they've eaten to help break up their food. Earthworms do not have lungs, but they do have blood which is pumped throughout their bodies via five pairs of aortic arches, which act similar to a human heart. Earthworms are pretty cool. Okay, well, maybe not literally because we know what happens when they get too cold, but they're cool because they are both male and female at the same time, but they still mix and mingle in order to have babies. When earthworms mate, their clitellum produces a fluid around it. Each worm will pass through the other's clitellum fluid, and it'll get mixed with their own. At the end of the process, that'll end up being an egg cocoon that will get buried into the ground. After about three weeks, baby earthworms will emerge. They'll spend their first year growing into adult-sized worms, and then continue on for up to six years, or, you know, at least as long as they can avoid bats, birds, and small mammals. Playground talk will lead you to believe that these worms can survive if torn into pieces. They'll just sprout whatever is missing and go on with their life as if nothing ever happened. Although it seems to be highly debated how well these worms are able to regrow missing parts, the general consensus I seem to find is that the head section will grow a new tail if the worm was cut under its clitellum. Of course, some worms, like the planarian flatworm, who's not an earthworm, can pretty much regrow all of the things. There have been studies to try and determine how the earthworm regrows and at what point it can, but it seems for now the findings are inconclusive. 